And let's take our Bibles together, if we could, and turn to the book of Psalms, and then find Psalm 85 in your Bibles, Psalm 85, and uh, we'll begin our reading in verse number one. The Psalms, and then the 85th Psalm together. Beginning in verse number one, the Bible says, Thou hast been favorable unto thy land, that was brought back the captivity of Jacob. Thou hast given, uh, forgiven the iniquity of thy people, that was covered all their sins, Selah. Thou hast taken away all thy wrath, thou hast turned thyself from the fierce, uh, fierceness of thine anger. Uh, turn us, O God, of our salvation, and cause thine anger toward us to cease. Wilt thou be angry with us forever? Wilt thou draw us out of uh, thine anger to all generations? Will thou not revive us again? that thy people may rejoice in thee. Show us thy mercy, O Lord, and grant us thy salvation. I want us to notice what the Bible says in verse 6. It tells us in this scripture, Wilt thou not revive us again? Let's pray. Father, help us tonight as uh, we have come together. Uh, Lord, tonight a time of, of singing songs that uh, lift up your name and a time of prayer and and then, Lord, as we briefly open the Word of God and, and look at these biblical truths, I pray that you would speak to our hearts, and I pray that you would direct us, help us, Lord, to see where we are and where we ought to be. And, uh, Lord, we'll give you the thanks for it, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, there's little doubt about the background of this particular psalm. This is right after the return of God's people from Babylon. On one hand, there is this remarkable fact that God did a, a great work in their midst and brought back the people. But on the other hand, everywhere you look, there was destruction and uh, everything was destroyed. I mean, the temple was, was in rubble and everywhere as far as the eye could see, there was debris and there was desolation. The Babylonians had done a thorough job of uh, the demolishing of, of, of uh, the city, and um, everywhere was in ruins. And the, the psalmist's heart is breaking as uh, he writes Psalm 85, as he looks at where Israel was and where they are now, and yet God had mercy on them, and God allowed them to come back, and yet we find in this passage of Scripture that his cry to God is for revival. And that really is my thought as we move into the uh, September months and uh, we have our revival services the end of September with Dr. Larry Clayton. I want us to just take a moment tonight and think about revival. What is revival? Let's think about this if we could tonight. Why don't we have revival? You know, some people have suggested that we don't have revival because of our plans, because of spiritual pride, because we have our ideas of where we want to be. And it doesn't really matter what God wants for my life. I want to be here and I want to do this and I want to be a part of this. And it doesn't matter what the Lord has. It reminds me of a story of a, of a man who saw a grandmother walking down the road with two young uh, grandchildren. And the man asked the grandmother, uh, the older lady, um, how old are your grandchildren? And uh, the grandmother looked at the, the two boys and said, well, the doctor is six and the lawyer is four. <laughs> and, you know, that's, that's kind of our attitude when it comes to the things of God. We have our plans, right? And we don't want God to intervene with what we want to do. Why don't we have revival? Is it because of our plans, our ideas? Maybe tonight we've just lost our way. Maybe we don't have revival because... Maybe we've lo we're lost and, and uh, we don't know what direction to take next. A tourist turned to his Native American guide and said, Are we lost? And uh, the guide paused for a moment and said, We not lost. We right here. The path lost. <laughs> and uh, maybe that's us. Maybe the problem is we're right here. And that's the problem. We're right here. And we don't want to change direction in our life. Why don't we have revival? Let's answer this question. What is revival? What does it mean to be revived? Well, Charles Finley uh, defines revival as nothing else 
than a new beginning of obedience to God. Nothing else. Revival is just a new beginning in obedience to God. Arthur Wallace, in his book entitled, In the Day of Thy Power, he writes this. He said, the meaning of any word is determined by its usage. For a definition of revival, we must therefore appeal to the people of God and bygone years who have uh, used the word with consistency of meaning down through the centuries until it came to be used in a lesser and more limited sense in modern times. He writes, revival is God revealing himself to mankind in awesomeness and power. Uh, J. Edwin Orr tells us that the best definition of revival is the phrase, times of refreshing. Now, we can put all of that together. And we could say that revival is a new opportunity to obey the Lord. It is a refreshing in our life. It is a change of direction. It is God showing himself to us in his power and his holiness and us making a decision based upon that. We need to change the way that we live our life. Let me say this. Revival is simply building up ourselves in our most holy faith. So revival takes action. And I want to give you some thoughts from Psalm 85 about revival, where we are right now, and uh, this is an individual personal matter, where we are right now and the direction that we're heading in. So number one, I want us to think about the reality of revival, the reality of revival. And I'll, I'll, I'll explain this in just a moment, but look what the Bible says in our text, verse number six. The Bible says, Will thou not revive us again? that thy people may rejoice in thee. Show us thy mercy, O Lord, and grant us thy salvation. Now, because there's a plea for revival, we would say that there was a need for revival. Because there was a plea for revival, there was definitely a need for revival. And the psalmist, crying out to God on behalf of himself and Israel, is saying, Lord, revive us again. There's a great need for a rekindling of our heart toward you. Now, C.H. Spurgeon said this about revival. He said, a genuine revival without joy in the Lord is as impossible as spring without flowers or day dawn without light. And so, as we consider this thought in this passage of Scripture, this heart cry for revival, revive us again, I want to say this, that God's people at this particular time, as they're crying unto God, they're a miserable people. I mean, they have lost the joy of what God had given them to do in involving the temple, involving uh, what, what, uh, what God has given them to do with tradition and all of these things. God, they, they have lost all of these things. They're a scattered people. Everything is in, in turmoil and debris, and their heart is seeking, and here they have lost their joy. You know, we need revival tonight if we've lost our joy in the things of the Lord. And maybe this is you tonight. The simple truths of living the Christian life, there's just not this joy anymore. The joy of talking to someone about the Lord. The joy of opening the Bible and hearing it preached or reading it in our quiet time and, and allowing God to speak to our hearts. The joy of coming into God's house. The joy of prayer. The, the joy of serving the Lord and working for the Lord. There's just not this joy anymore. Let me suggest to you tonight that you need revival. Now, all of us need revival. There's, there's areas in all of our lives that need to be revived. This is the reality of revival. All of us could say, Lord, revive us again. Now, I want you to turn to Psalm 51. Psalm number 51. Psalm 51 is a, a favorite passage of Scripture of many people. And uh, the background of Psalm 51 is David getting his heart right with God. Bible teachers will tell us that David lived his life for one whole year uh, before he confessed his sin. And David was a miserable man. I mean, for those days of living uh, outside of, of fellowship with the Lord, he was a miserable man. He had no walk with God. And, and uh, you know, you could see it on his face. You could see it when you were around him. I think people were going around saying, don't talk to David. He's, he's a grump. He's, he's miserable. Don't, don't go around David. And uh, 
he's crying out to God in Psalm 51. And I love this psalm, and many of you love it as well, because this is the mercy of God on display. Here's a man that's crying out to the Lord, Psalm 51, verse 10. He says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Let me just give you a thought here uh, to, to help you understand what that means. In the New Testament, when we trust Christ as our Savior, the Holy Spirit indwells us. And we have the Holy Spirit. It seals us until, until the day of promise. The Holy Spirit never leaves us. But in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come upon someone for a specific purpose. And there's no doubt about it, God was using King David in a special way throughout uh, the, new, uh, the, uh, the Old Testament. And, and here we find this broken fellowship with God because of his sin, because of his unconfessed sin. God was not hearing his prayer, and there's this broken fellowship, and he cries to God in verse 12. He says, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit, that I will teach transgressors the way, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Now, we'll come back to this passage of Scripture in a moment, but what I want to focus on is the returning of this joy of God's salvation. There is wonderful joy in salvation. And that is knowing our sins are forgiven, knowing we're on our way to heaven. By the way, God has given us joy and God wants this joy to be overflowing in our life. And the devil wants to, to, to destroy that joy and get rid of that joy. And I think the, one of the ways that he'll do this in the child of God's life is to uh, bring things in their life that they would cause them to doubt their salvation. Cause them not to have confidence in the Lord. And that's not my message tonight. You go through the Bible, the New Testament, and look what the Bible says about having confidence in the Christian life. It's important. It's what God wants us to have. It, it, it's joy-filled. This joy-filled life is a confident Christian life, but the devil wants to, uh, to take that away from us. He's a thief. He wants to steal that from us. But God gives us life and life more abundantly. And so we have in this passage of Scripture the restoration and the rekindling of this joy in our life. And that's where we want to be. If that joy is taken away from your Christian life, I mean, if it's just the... the uh, the routine of the Christian life that, you know, you come to church, you read your Bible, you carry your Bible, you serve here, you serve there, you do that. That's not the way God wants the Christian life to be lived. God wants it to be lived with joy and, and with, with um, this excitement. And so we need revival. We need to be stirred up. We need the reality of this revival is that we need to be stirred up for the Lord. But then not only is there the reality of revival, in this scripture we see the road to revival. Now look what the Bible says in verse 2. Psalm 85, back to our text, and verse number 2. The Bible says, Thou hast forgiven the iniquity of thy people, thou hast covered all their sins, Selah, thou hast taken away all thy wrath, thou hast turned thyself from the fierceness of thine anger. Verse 4, Turn us, O God, of our salvation and cause thine anger toward us to cease. You know, I think this. There is great spiritual maturity in an individual that realizes they're heading in the wrong direction in their life. And they cry out to God for a turning. Now, when we think of turning, we're talking about repentance. We say this individual repented of their sin. They turned from their sin, or we could say they turned to God from their sin. As the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians, the Bible says they turn to God from idols. And so repentance is turning to God from your sin, walking away from that life and that sin and turning to the Lord. This is a turning that takes place in our life. There's a turning that is taking place in, in the, the children of Israel's life here. There's a cry to God, turn us, O Lord, of our salvation. And this requires action. So we talk about the road to revival. I'm just saying that revival won't just happen. We can't just sit here like frogs on a log. Is that even a, a comparison? I, I don't know. But we can't just sit here and say, Lord, send us revival. Draw near to God and he'll draw near to us. You see, there's, there's an action that has to take place. And here the child of God 
is crying out to God, the psalmist is saying, Lord, turn us. We're heading in the wrong direction, and this, this is going to affect our life and our children's life and their grandchildren. This is going to impact us in a negative way. Lord, change our direction. This is the action. Second Chronicles chapter 7. Turn there tonight. Second Chronicles. This is a familiar scripture when talked about revival, but I think we need to look at it tonight because we often, how easy we forget it. It is a great passage of scripture. Second Chronicles and the seventh chapter. Second Chronicles and chapter number 7. In verse 14, I'll read together. Let's uh, look at it together. 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. The Bible says, If my people which are called by my name, look at this, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked way, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will hear, heal their land. You know, we don't just keep doing something. If we know it's wrong, if we know we're heading in the wrong direction, we don't just keep heading in that direction because of convenience. Well, many do. We don't just keep heading in that direction because of a, a, a fleshly appetite. The, the thought in this passage of Scripture is, Lord, take away this spiritual pride and turn the ship, turn the direction of my life. This is wrong. This is going to hurt me. Turn me, O oh Lord, change me. This is the road to revival. There, there's a, a decision that has to take place. And God help. I'm not saying you have to have all the answers. I'm not saying you have to have all the T's crossed and the I's dotted. I'm just saying it begins with this hard decision. Lord, this is the wrong direction, and I know it's the wrong direction. Lord, turn me, change me. Lord, I know this is going to hurt me. Turn my direction, Lord. This is where it begins. It is what the Bible says, humbling ourselves and praying and seeking God's face and turning from this wicked way. Then God says, I'll hear from heaven. Then I'll forgive their sin. Then I'll heal, heal their land. You see, revival takes effort. It takes effort. Stephen Alford writes in his book, A Heart Cry for Revival. This is what he says. You listen as I read this paragraph from his book. This is Stephen F. Alford. He writes this, If there is to be revival of spiritual life and power, it must begin with the individual believer. And there is great need for a personal searching of the heart, an exercise of soul in this matter. The sin which is spoiling the life of the Christian must be judged and put away. The selfishness which is robbing Christ's love and devotion which are his due must be confessed and removed. The ambitions and desires which are hindering the work of God must be uprooted and thrown on a refusal, a refusal heap. A renewal of blessing is dependent upon restoration of communion and the uh, re-consecration of heart and of life. And this is the road of revival, is to realize, hey, this is going to hurt me. Lord, I know I'm heading in the wrong direction. Turn me, O oh Lord. Turn me, O oh Lord. This is where revival begins. It is the attitude of Psalm 139. Let's turn there. Psalm 139. And verse number one, this is the attitude that we find in verse number one, 139, uh, Psalm 139, verse one. This is the attitude we must all have. O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. This is a great truth. Thou hast know, known, uh, knoweth my downsending and mine uprising. Thou understandeth my thought afar off. In other words, you understand my thoughts what I'm going to think about before I even think it. This is the power of God. They'll, they'll compass my path and my lying down. They're acquainted with all my ways. God knows everything about you. God knows what you do. God knows why you did it. God knows the thought process that took place in your life before you even say a word. That's what he says in verse 4. He says, for there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it all together. You know, someone may say a word and you say, wow, where did that come from? God knows where it came from. 
God knows that word, and God knows the makeup of that word, and the attitude of the heart, and all of it put together. God knows why you said it. God knows what's in your heart. God knows your action. God knows what you did. God knows why you do it. And yet, what is the heartbeat of the psalmist, verse 23? He says, Lord, search me, O God, and know my heart, and try me, and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. You see, here's the thought. God knows everything about you. You say, then why would you say God search my heart? Because it's not so much God searching the heart as you allowing God to show you what's in your heart. It's your attitude toward God. It's your attitude toward what is in your heart. The problem is, if God shows you what is wrong, are you willing to change it? Are you willing tonight to change direction if God says, hey, that attitude or that direction will harm you, will harm your family, will harm your children. If you keep taking those steps based on the word of God, it's going to be a bad end for you. Would you change? Well, that's the psalmist's heart. Search me, O God. I'm willing to change. Show me this wicked way. Show me which way I'm heading in the wrong direction. And I'll turn, Lord. See, that's what we have in this passage of Scripture. A lot of Bible teachers believe that the seven churches in Revelation are actually seven ages that we find in the church age. I'm not sure. The Bible doesn't tell us that that is so. But if that is true, then we are living in the Laodicean church age. It is the, the age of indifference. It is the age of I don't care. It is the age of just coasting through. It is the age of what Paul the Apostle told Timothy, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. It is an indifferent attitude to the things of the Lord. It is the age of Revelation chapter 3 where we believe that we are rich and we are wealthy and we have need of nothing and yet God says, don't you see that you're miserable and you're poor and you're blind and you're naked? You see, the problem with the Laodicean church age is that we don't think we have anything wrong with us. We don't need revival, right? I mean, well, yeah, I have some problems, but compared to so-and-so, I'm doing okay. If anyone needs revival, well, that's so-and-so. That's the Laodicean church age. But the attitude that we need is search me, O Lord, and see if there be any wicked way in me. And Lord, I'm willing to change. If you direct me, I'm willing to make a difference. I'm, I'm willing to make those steps of repentance and change direction to turn around. Search me, O God, the hymn writer said, and know my heart today. Try me, O Savior, and know my thoughts, I pray. See if there be some wicked way in me. Cleanse me from every sin and set me free. O Holy Ghost, revival comes from thee. Send a revival. Start the work in me. Thy word declares thou wilt supply our need. For blessings now, O Lord, I humbly plead. You see, the reality is this road to revival is action on our part. Lord, look at my heart and see where I need to change direction in my life. Then let me give you the reason for revival. I told you I'd return to Psalm 51. Let's turn there quickly this evening. We're running out of time, but let's look at what the Bible says. In verse number 8, Psalm 51 and verse number 8. Psalm 51 and verse 8. Uh, the Bible says, Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Verse 11, cast not away, uh, away from thy presence. This idea, if I could go back to this thought, verse 11, to be cast away from God's presence speaks of God's favor upon your life. And oftentimes in the Old Testament, it would use the expression that God's face would be... Uh, would, uh, be um, uh, shine upon us. And that expression that God's face would shine upon you just speaks of God's favor upon your life. And, and this is what David is crying out to God, that God's favor would be upon him, that his presence would not be removed, that the Holy Spirit and God's work would not be taken away from him. And verse 11, restore unto me the joy of, of thy salvation. Uphold me with thy free spirit. Now notice the reason why this revival in David's heart, verse number 13, that when I... Uh, uh, then will I teach transgressors the ways, and sinners will be converted unto thee. Now, you think about this. 
what does this tell you if we're going to be a proper Bible student and properly find the exegesis of Scripture or the order of Scripture or the, the, the thought of this passage of Scripture? What is David saying? David is saying that in his present condition of indifference, there was no soul winning taking place. There was no one being reached for Christ or, or for the Lord. There, there, there was no one turning to the Lord because of David's life. His present condition were not drawing people to the Lord, but they were pushing people away. And he's saying that the purpose of this revival is that I will teach transgressors the ways and sinners will be converted unto thee. Revival is for this one purpose, that when we get our heart, uh, heart right with God, we will do the purpose of God, and therefore sinners will be converted for the glory of God. That's why revival happens. That's why we are renewed or rekindled. We will see the need. Jesus said, look on the harvest, for they are white already to harvest, and pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth labors unto the harvest. Christians are revived so that we can see the need. We can see the harvest. In this unrevived state, we don't see the need. We are self-centered. We are looking at ourselves, And this is why we need revival. This is why we need to be stirred in this day, in this place, in our hearts, so that we can see the need. In 1904, all of Wales was aflame. Nothing had ever come over Wales with such a fear and far-reaching results. Infidels were converted. Drunkards, thieves, and gamblers were saved. And thousands reclaimed to respectability. The people left theaters for churches and mules and coal mines, refused to work because they weren't used to such kindness. In five weeks, 20,000 people joined churches. And it all started with just a handful of people that got honest with God and took that first step and said, Lord, show us where we're, we're the wrong direction and we're willing to change. And they got their hearts right with God. And because of that, in 1904, all of Wales was on fire for God. Revival can start in us tonight, if we have this prayer, Lord, am I heading in the right direction? Lord, what in my life needs to change today? You say, well, Pastor, God knows everything about you. But this is not about God. This is about you. Are you willing to say, all right, Lord, I'll change. I'll follow you. You see, it can happen in our life, it can happen in our midst, it can happen in our families. If we would just take that step to the Lord, draw near to God, the Bible says, and he will draw near to you. You know what I believe? I believe God is waiting to give revival if we would just take that step and say, oh Lord, use me, use me. Revive us again is the heartbeat of the psalmist. May that be our prayer in this place tonight. Let's pray together tonight, can we? Father in heaven, help us, I pray. And Father, I pray for each of us, Lord. I know, Lord, that as we dismiss uh, tonight, the, the devil will quickly try to take this seed from our heart. But Lord, I pray that Psalm 85 would ring true and uh, Lord would continually uh, be heard in our life tonight. And Father, may we, in, in, in uh, days ahead and moments ahead, May we get alone with you and may we seek your face. And Father, I pray you would direct us and turn us, Lord, I pray. And I, I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.